Well, let's turn in our Bibles to Philippians chapter 2. You should find a Bible near you if you don't have one with you. And the passage, verses 19 to the end of the chapter in verse 30, and it's on page 981, or if you're using the large print version, it's on page 1165. So, Philippians chapter 2, verses 19 to 30. Um, We've seen in Philippians that Paul is writing to a congregation he describes as his joy and crown church, his crown and joy church. And it may be this is, of all the letters Paul writes to whole congregations, um, this is the one with whom he had the easiest relationship, uh, and he writes to them in very warm terms. He's a prisoner, um, almost certainly in Rome. He's been there uh, as the last uh, part of the Acts of the Apostles tells us for probably now almost two years. Um, unlike our own prisoners in the United Kingdom, he's a prisoner at his own expense. It would be a novel idea to suggest to the government that prisoners live at their own expense, and the Philippians have sent him money, uh, presumably to help with the expenses. And they've also sent a man, I assume one of their elders, possibly uh, their own minister, a man by the name of Epaphroditus, uh, who in this passage Paul describes as their apostle. So, in the New Testament, there are two kinds of apostle. There are apostles of Jesus Christ, whom Jesus Christ Himself personally immediately commissions, and there are other people called apostles who are commissioned by churches. And as you probably know, apostle is really the same word as missionary. Apostle comes from the Greek verb to send, missionary comes from the Latin verb to send. And uh, on his journey, or by the time he got to Rome, Epaphroditus has taken sick. Paul is writing to thank the Philippians. He's also writing to express his concern for them. And that's particularly expressed in chapter 1, verse 27. Let your manner of life be worthy of the gospel of Christ, so that whether I come and see you or am absent, I may hear of you that you're standing firm in one spirit with one mind, striving side by side for the faith of the gospel. So he's wanting to see this church family wholly united in order that Jesus' prayer may be fulfilled in their witness that when we are one, as the Lord Jesus is one with the Father, then the world begins to see the power of the gospel in the life of the fellowship. And so, we come to what he's saying in chapter 2, verse 19. And all this in this section seems very mundane by comparison with earlier on in chapter 2, but it is itself fascinating. I hope in the Lord Jesus to send Timothy to you soon, so that I too may be cheered by news of you. For I have no one like him who will be genuinely concerned for your welfare. For they all seek their own interests, not those of Jesus Christ. But you know Timothy's proven worth, how as a son with a father he has served with me in the gospel. I hope, therefore, to send him just as soon as I see how it will go with me. And I trust in the Lord that shortly I myself will come also. I thought it necessary to send to you Epaphroditus, my brother and fellow worker and fellow soldier and your messenger, and minister to my need, for he has been longing for you all and has been distressed because you heard that he was ill. Indeed, he was ill, 
near to death. But God had mercy on him, and not only on him, but on me also, lest I should have sorrow upon sorrow. I'm the more eager to send him, therefore, that you may rejoice at seeing him again, and that I may be less anxious. So receive him in the Lord with all joy, and honor such men, for he nearly died for the work of Christ risking his life to complete what was lacking in your service to me. One of the most obvious things about the Apostle Paul was that he had a tremendously logical mind. And it looks as though when you read his 13 letters to churches and to individuals, he never wrote or dictated a single paragraph without there being a reason for it. And so, as you read through his letters, certainly if you've got an English Standard Version, uh, you'll find that his letters are punctuated by words like, therefore, because of this, therefore, this follows. Or words like, so, because this is true, so this is also true. And there are actually not too many places in Paul's letters where you're left scratching your head thinking, why has he moved from saying this to saying this? Usually, if you listen with some sympathy and attention, you can can almost see into his mind, I see why he says this and how it's connected to that. And at first sight, this paragraph that we've just read seems an exception to that rule. And in fact, many of the commentators think it's an exception to that rule. There's something mysterious about what he says here because it doesn't seem to be connected to what he has just said. And so, some people have thought maybe he was just intending to finish the letter here and and to make a few personal comments. Or maybe he wanted to insert here, as he sometimes does, a kind of travelogue, um, kind of moment of light relief in the middle of all the the profound teaching he's giving. Oh, by the way, this is how things are going with me, without any deep-seated real connection to what he has already said. But I think if we are patient with Paul, and sometimes we do need to be patient because we are very impatient ourselves, I think if we are patient with Paul, we will discover that this paragraph is actually intimately related to the teaching he's just being given. He's been teaching us that the secret of Christian unity is humility, and that the secret of humility is Christ-centeredness in our lives that leads, as he had said in the section that we looked at last week, to a congregation in which murmuring and grumbling and complaining begins to diminish, and the Christian fellowship looks so different from worldly communities, where somebody is always complaining about something. And so, what I want us to try and do is to reflect in in three ways on what Paul is actually saying in these verses and what he is trying to communicate very graciously and pastorally, almost without saying, this is what I'm telling you. He actually tells them and tells us some really important things. The first is that in these verses, I think we should notice that the Apostle Paul is actually sharing his reassessment of the providences of God. He's sharing his reassessments of the providences of God. Um, Notice what he says. He says, I hope in the Lord Jesus to send Timothy to you soon. And then, further down in verse 25, I've thought it necessary to send you, that is, send you now, Epaphroditus. 
Now, there's probably a backstory to this. I was very helped years ago by a comment that one of my colleagues, Moises Silva, makes in his commentary on Philippians, where he says, I think the backstory here is that the Philippians had sent Pastor Epaphroditus with the money to Paul, but also to minister to him in the hope that if Epaphroditus was there for a while with Paul in prison, then Paul could send Timothy to them. And they obviously loved Timothy. And Paul is saying, I am not sending Timothy to you now, although I know how much he means to you. And if you know the story of the Acts of the Apostles, you know why this would be true. When Paul came to Philippi, Timothy had just joined the evangelistic band that the Apostle Paul led. This was Timothy's first adventure in overseas mission. He was a young Christian, and he'd already gone through this strange adventure Paul had, trying to go one place to preach, trying to go another place to preach. He'd remember he is the vision in the middle of the night, and they end up in Macedonia, in Philippi, and there the gospel breaks in. And Timothy had been there, the, the youngest Christian in the apostolic band, spending time with the youngest Christians in the whole world. And if you look back to your own early days as a Christian or your own early days involved in any kind of Christian witness or Christian mission of any kind, it wouldn't surprise me that the, the bonds that you formed in those days are bonds that have lasted forever. I was thinking during the week of bonds made in my life when I was a youngster that are still with me, that, that somehow or another seem to be very special relationships that you might not see people for another 20 years, 30 years, unbelievably 40 years, and you meet them again, and it's as though you saw them yesterday, because there is this very special bond between you. And not only that, but they knew that nobody knew the Apostle Paul the way Timothy knew him. So, when Timothy comes, they'll get the real truth about the Apostle Paul. They'll be able to pray for him better. They'll understand his situation better. And so, the very first words here are like a word of disappointment. I'm going to send Timothy to you soon, but not now. For now, because I have nobody like him, and because everybody seems to seek their own and not the interests of Christ and others, for that reason I feel I need him here with me just now until I find out what my legal situation is going to be. So, that first section I think must have come to the Philippians as a, a real disappointment they had anticipated their expectations of how the providence of God would work out in this situation. I think we can assume they did what we do. If this is the plan, then this is the plan, and that's how it will work out. And it's not working out in that way in the providences of God gives such a lie, doesn't it? And uh, we'll see this even more. Give such a lie to the notion that if you fully obey God, if you trust exclusively in Christ, then things are all going to work out the way you expect it. And in this instance, they're not working out the way the Philippians had expected. And then when you read on to Epaphroditus, Epaphroditus is gone. He's gone with the money. He's gone to change places with Timothy. Uh, they're very excited about the fact that they're now able to help the Apostle Paul again. But look at what has happened. Epaphroditus, either on the way or when he got to Rome, took ill and actually almost died. 
And interestingly, instead of relieving Paul's burden, that actually increased Paul's burden. Do you notice how he says, thank God that Epaphroditus lived because his situation was actually causing me distress? And somehow the Philippians had heard what had got back to the Philippians. And the fascinating thing about Epaphroditus, this, you've got to love this about Epaphroditus. If you had a good mother, then Epaphroditus was like a good mother. Epaphroditus was distressed. Why? Not because he was sick, but because the Philippians had heard he was sick. He was more concerned about being a, I don't want to be a worry to anybody. But the thing I want to point out is that just as the providences of God seem to have taken a strange turn in Timothy, they've taken what seems to be almost a disastrous turn with Epaphroditus, because what is happening is Paul has said to Epaphroditus, Epaphroditus, you'd better go home. You'd better go home. So that the only thing it seems Epaphroditus managed to accomplish of the mission the Philippians had sent him on was to hand over the money. And now he's going home, disappointed in the mission he was sent on. Things seem to be crumbling in his hands. Now, there's one more step to take in this picture of the providences of God needing to be reassessed by the Apostle Paul. But I want to pause for a moment to make this point. You remember what Paul has just said to the Philippians? Do absolutely everything without grumbling and complaining. And now he's setting before them two very obvious situations that are tinder for grumbling and complaining. We're not getting Timothy and Epaphroditus has failed in his mission. But there's a third element to this reassessment of the providences of God, and to me it's actually the most remarkable of them, because it's the one you can most easily miss. There's a reassessment of them in Paul's own life. Notice these words he says in verse 24, I trust in the Lord that shortly I myself will come, that is, come to Philippi also. That, that strike you as being absolutely radically dramatic? Well, no, it probably doesn't. But let me show you why it is. Remember what Paul writes in the first chapter of Romans? He writes to the Romans, says, I've been desperate to come to visit you. But every time I've tried, something has got in the way. Then when you get to the end of Romans, or almost the end, chapter 15, he's on his way to take an offering to the church in Jerusalem where he'll be arrested. And then this happens four years probably before Philippians was written. Four years ago, he was arrested. And that was what began the train of events that eventually got him to the city of Rome where he'd always longed to go. So, in a way, he hadn't expected God was giving him what he always longed for. But actually, at the end of Romans, he says, my plan is this. When I've seen you in Rome, I'm going further west to Spain. That has been in his mind since about A.D. 57. This is about A.D. 61. That has been in his mind for four years, see Rome, and then go on to a new glorious missionary enterprise in Spain. And four years later, that aspiration of going to Rome being fulfilled, you'll notice how he has reassessed the providences of God in his own life. He's actually, and th this is really the challenge, he has put it in black and white, I plan to go to Spain. And now he's putting it in black and white, when I am released, 
and I'm able to leave the city of Rome. I'm not going to Spain. I'm coming to you. Now, this is speculative. There is a reasonable chance that the Philippians had a copy of the letter to the Romans. The apostle Peter tells us, doesn't he, in 2 Peter, that there were collections of Paul's letters, not just in one church, but held by all the churches. And if by any chance the Philippians had his letter to the Romans written six years ago, maybe, they knew that was the plan. And so, what he's doing here at the end, he's in a sense, he's saying, this is, this is, this is how I read the providences of God with respect to Timothy. This is how I read the providences of God with respect to Epaphroditus. But I'm telling you this as somebody who himself has been subject to my understanding that there are times when God closes doors and opens others that we need to go through. And there's more than one occasion in Paul's life when that happened. A staggering occasion in 2 Corinthians 2, 12 and 13, where he says there was a tremendous door of opportunity for the gospel open to me, but I couldn't go through it because I was so distressed about the situation with our brother Titus. And so all my aspirations, all my hopes became subject to the immediacy of the providences of God in my life in connection with another brother. It's staggering. And yet, of all people, the Philippians should have been able to understand this, shouldn't they? Because the only reason that Paul had gone to Philippi was because door after door had been closed in his life, and he knew that he needed to read the providences of God in his life in a sensitive way that would enable him to yield, to have his life reshaped by how the providences of God were working out in his actual situation. Uh, maybe that's news to you. Maybe until this point in your life, life has been an upward trajectory. It's unlikely that it will always be like that. It's highly likely that you and I will find situations where the providences of God seem to cross the designs that we have in our own life. God has called us here, and we've sought to serve Him here. We've been obedient here, and, and we assumed that then it would be thus and so. If God has done this, then He would do that. Sometimes, maybe this is a bit cynical, people have said to me, made a decision, and the way has been smoothed, and they've said to me, just like God to do that. And I've thought, yes, but it's also just like God for you to be obedient to Him, and things seem to crumble in your hands. Remember how the disciples were absolutely obedient, especially those who were fishermen, Lake of Galilee sailors, how they were resolutely obedient to Jesus when He said, let's get into the boat tonight, boys, and we'll go over to the other side. And the whole thing collapsed before their very eyes. Did it happen because they were disobedient? My friends, that's a myth that has been too often purveyed in the life of the Christian church that if you're obedient to the Lord, then His providences will work out in a way that satisfies you. God in His providence is seeking to satisfy Himself, and we will be satisfied with God's providences only when we are first of all, of course, satisfied with Him. Um, 
Remember the words of uh, the imitation of Christ, man proposes, God disposes. Or the title of Thomas Boston's little book, The Crook in the Lot, based on the words of Ecclesiastes 7.13, consider the work of God. Who can make straight what He has made crooked? So, what's the deal? The deal is there are situations put into our lives that using the means God has given to us, we can change. But when it becomes clear that God has given us no means by which we can change the situation, our peace lies not in struggle, but in acceptance and in yielding to His wisdom and saying, if this is the way then, Lord, I will walk in it. And what interests me, what is so intriguing to me, is that Paul manages to communicate all this to the Philippians without kind of making it a big proposition as though it were just a, here's the deal, get it into your thick heads and learn it, that if God and His providence is doing this, you'd better shut up and go on with it. But he's speaking about these three men, himself included, who, and here's the connection, each of them is willing to do anything without grumbling and complaining. So that's really, I think, the big lesson. But there's another lesson, and it's connected to this concern that Paul has that the Philippians will do everything without grumbling and complaining. It's not just his reassessment of the providences of God. It's the way he expresses his profound appreciation for his fellow believers. This is actually unparalleled, matchless in Paul's letters. He quite often mentions people, and he says really great things about them, but usually it's, it's just a line, maybe even half a line, beautiful things. But here he takes this whole paragraph to focus our attention on these two brothers, Timothy on the one hand and Epaphroditus on the other. And it is amazing what he says about them, about Timothy. I've no one like him. You know his proven worth. You know he's been like a son to a father with me. You know he's been a, a servant of the gospel, a slave of the gospel. And, you know, if that weren't enough, when he turns to Epaphroditus, what he says about Epaphroditus is even more generous. And this, without any collusion between Will and myself, this this is what it means to live as a Christian believer. Uh, as your Father is generous to you, although you are a sinner, then how about being generous to others? Look at what he says about Epaphroditus. The man is sick. The man, apparently, humanly speaking, has failed in his mission. But to Paul, it's not the issue of whether he has been successful in the mission the Philippians had for him. It's what he has been in himself, a brother, a fellow worker, a fellow soldier, your messenger, your minister to my needs. You think Paul is a big softy? I mean, there are indications in, in the New Testament that Timothy had some real weaknesses. And Epaphroditus does not seem to have been a great missionary success. So, is Paul a big softy? I think I'm not going to do it. Hands up if you think, if you've ever thought the Apostle Paul is a big softy. You know, you are really strange if you've ever thought that. You're more likely to have thought the opposite about the Apostle Paul. So, what's the deal here? Well, the deal here is, this is so often the solvent to our murmuring and complaining, that instead of murmuring and complaining about others, 
we think generously about them, and we speak generously about them. I'm actually, tell you the truth, I'm really surprised how searching this passage is, maybe just to me. Like over all the years I've been a Christian, I'm absolutely convinced I have known many Christians who have never said, at least in my hearing, a generous word about any fellow believer. And I know sometimes it's covered up with, we don't want him to get a big head. Well, apparently that was not Paul's concern with Timothy and Epaphroditus. Maybe Timothy and Epaphroditus overheard what he was saying, you know, hiding their faces because they were so embarrassed. But the real point is he was saying this to others. He was showing this heavenly father-like generosity of love and appreciation for what these men were, which to him was far more important than anything either of these men happened to accomplish. And it's a tremendous lesson. I'm not suggesting you do this, but if you kept a little notebook in your pocket and, and you, you became methodistical, as uh, the early Wesleyans were, and uh, just made a little note every time you grumbled and complained about something or somebody, and made a little note every time you spoke with exquisite generosity about a fellow Christian. What would the score be at the end of the year? And that leads us to the third thing, quickly. And it's this, that having reassessed the providences of God and having expressed this deep appreciation for these brothers in Jesus Christ, um, the third thing Paul is doing is, well, he's providing illustrations of the teaching he's just been given. What has he just said about the Lord Jesus? He said Jesus was more interested in other people's needs than in his own. Jesus became a servant. And that's exactly what he's been saying about Timothy and Epaphroditus. He's really saying without saying it, dear Philippians, actually he does say it at the end, doesn't he? He says in verse 29, when Epaphroditus returns, receive him in the Lord with all joy and honor such men, honor such men. You know, I think as he's sending them back, he's almost inevitably feeling, oh God, some of them are going to start grumbling and complaining about Epaphroditus, about me sending him back, about them not seeing Timothy, about the fact that he's not done what he was sent to do. But he's really saying to them, don't you see what the Lord Jesus has given to you? He's given to you and to me two men who have been illustrations of the person and the disposition of the Lord Jesus towards you. And I think that's why he uses this expression. He uses it more than once. He says, now, he says, I, I, I'm, I want to do all of this in the Lord. This is what I'm hoping for, in the Lord. And that little phrase again in verse 29, so receive him in the Lord that when our eyes are fixed on the Lord Jesus and we see these, these little glimpses of the Lord Jesus in our fellow believers and our generous spirited in thankfulness for what the Lord Jesus has done in them and what He has given to us through them, then all the murmuring and grumbling and complaining begins to be dissipated and the unity of the church family inevitably increases. And it becomes clear that, as he had said in the previous passage, that we are children of God in a twisted and crooked generation. And Christ has made us the light of the world in a world that is full of 
the deepest darkness. And all of this, um, it looks just in passing before he comes to what personally I have always regarded as a much more important passage that begins in Philippians chapter 3, verse 1. But you see what he's saying. He'd said it actually in his letter to the Romans, God has only one plan for you, and it will be worked out according to His sovereign providences as you yield to them in the Lord. He has predestined you to be conformed to the image of His Son, that He might be the firstborn among many brothers. And that's what he's pointing out really in Timothy and Epaphroditus. He's saying, Philippians, I've just described the wonder of the humility and grace of our Lord Jesus Christ to you. And you can see it in these men. So, with them, yield to the Lord. Bow before the providences in your life that He has not given you the means to change. And what you will discover is that you are changed through them, that He moves you on to something different in which He means, like Timothy and Epaphroditus, to make you fruitful. These uh, verses are an amazing way of giving pastoral wisdom without apparently trying to give any pastoral wisdom at all, just like the way the Lord Jesus so often did it. Let's pray. Lord, we thank You for Your Word. We thank You that You have called us to live by every word that comes from Your mouth. And we pray as we see our own lives, for some of us life really is relatively speaking, plain sailing. Others of us um, find ourselves like Epaphroditus, distressed because of the way in which your providences seem to have worked out in our lives, and we find it so difficult. We struggle to change things. We pray you would bring us to accept your ways, trust in your wisdom, and know that You are, through these things, making us more and more like our Lord Jesus Christ, not least for the benefit of our fellow believers. We are all needy, Lord. We all lack wisdom. We are all in danger of being full of ourselves and emptied of Christ. But we pray You would empty us of our own wisdom and fill us with His wisdom, that we may live individually together as a church family, as a people of God united in Christ, yielded to Christ in a twisted generation, shining as lights in the darkness to point the way through our lives and by our lips to the grace and saving love of our dear Lord Jesus. So, hear us, we pray, and help us for His name's sake. Amen.